All right, so good morning. Um, today we're going to talk about maternal mental health. So yes, postpartum, but also intrapartum. So peripartal mood and anxiety disorders. And here's some of our objectives. Look at perinatal medicine. It's sort of a new and burgeoning field, but it's really exciting for people who have um, gone through nine years of residency. It gives them something to do with their time, like myself. Um, understand the importance of perinatal health for women, children, and families. So we'll do some of the statistics so you can realize just how many people are affected and how much uh, support these women might need. Delineate some of the main features of uh, postpartum blues, depression, and psychosis. And I want to take a little time to separate out depression versus bipolar disorder versus psychosis, which is a psychiatric emergency so that you guys are prepared, should you see it, to get these people to um, the proper referrals they need. And then incorporate the influence of hormones if we have time. My slides are a little stacked heavy, so I'm, I'm gonna try and keep us on track. Um, so let's go ahead and start where it all began, the history of women's mental disorders. So the first description dates back to 1900 BC. And throughout history, hysteria has been seen as sort of a sex-selecting disease. Now, I hope I'm not gonna offend any men in the room as I talk about this. I don't mean to, but it is sort of the facts of it. Um, uter the uteri of women have been thought responsible for a variety of health problems, fevers, anxiety, depression, insomnia, seizures, kleptomania throughout history. Sort of anything that men couldn't explain fell into the catch-all box of hysteria. And so it starts in ancient Greece and Egypt because they came up with this idea of the roaming uterus. So that was that women's wombs could move about their bodies and sit on other organs, causing them to be suffocated so they'd have symptoms of like anxiety. So let's just say you have a hysterical paroxysm in public and the thought is that your uterus roamed right on up to your lungs, got comfy, sat down, and you couldn't breathe, and so therefore you had this panic attack in public. And so what was the cure for this? Well, naturally, you put offending smells by the mouth and pleasant smells by the vagina. So you coax the uterus back into position, <laughs> right? It's pretty good. <laughs> but it, it, it's very funny, but also this is the origin of smelling salts. So it, it kept going for millennia. So then we move on. Sort of all ancient philosophers kind of started jumping on this bandwagon. Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates all opined um, that the uterus was sad and unfortunate and full of ill humors, and it needed help. And so where was it to turn? But towards the virile, strong, warm, dry male seed, because that was gonna solve all its problems, right? So that's where uh, hysteria and the cure for hysteria sort of gets tied to sex. But Serranus, sort of the, uh, the, modern, the founder of scientific OBGYN, sort of didn't buy into it. He was like, no, no, no. All these women don't need to have sex. What they need is rest. They need hot baths and massages and exercise to get better. So to my way of thinking, this man was on to something. But it didn't last. Um, around the time of 1880, Jean-Martin Charcot, who's a French um, medical professor, starts thinking that all these symptoms might be related to a neurologic disease. And so he's lecturing his medical students about this. And in his medical student lecture sits Sigmund Freud. And so he's listening to all this and interpreting all this. And he eventually graduates and goes on to develop his theories. And he sort of takes a riff from Jean-Martin Charcot. And he thinks, you know what? I don't think hysteria is a neurologic in basis. I think it really is psychiatric. And the problem, and we all probably know this, knowing what we know of Freud, was that women were unable to reconcile the loss of their metaphoric penis. They were so sad that they didn't have the penis, that they struggled with these symptoms of anxiety, depression, fainting, seizures, 
because it's so bad that you don't have a penis. So what's the cure? You've got to get close to one, right? <laughs> you just massage your way close to one. And this sort of fits the social mores of the time that you're supposed to be a, a good woman who's in a heterosexual marriage and having copious sex to satisfy your man and stomp out your ill humors. Yeah, woo, <laughs> that was a fun time to be around. Um, and so, oops, what happens if you're a nun? Or what happens if you're a woman that just can't find herself a good man? So you're alone at home and the ill humors are building up and you are overcome with emotion. Well, Dr. Mortimer Granville comes around and he says, you know what, I got the cure for that. It's called a vibrator. <laughs> this is, I can't make this up. <laughs> and so the vibrator was created to help those women who couldn't have healthy, virile, heterosexual sex, so instead they could get rid of their ill humors through hysterical paroxysm or orgasm. So really they were onto something. Okay, so it isn't until World War II that hysterical disease is more properly classified as the disorders it is, like conversion, panic, anxiety, and depressive symptoms. And sort of crazily, hysterical neurosis isn't dropped out of the DSM until 1980. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, and I gave you kind of the spectrum of what I practice, so that includes depression and puberty and um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, but we're gonna focus on today perinatal mood and anxiety, most predominantly prenatal, perinatal, postpartum depression and anxiety, postpartum bipolar disorder, and postpartum psychosis. I wanted you to see the full spectrum, but those are the three that uh, are the most common or the most serious. And then I also deal some with postmenopausal syndrome, which we can talk about tomorrow. Oops. So um, perinatal mental illness refers to psychiatric disorders that are prevalent during pregnancy and as long as one year after delivery. We throw any disorders that are recurring along with pregnancy or during pregnancy as part of perinatal mental illness. So why do we care about this? Let's first focus on our moms. Mood disorders do correlate with hormonal changes. History was not wrong about that, and the association has been recognized since ancient times. Depression is the leading cause of disease-related disability among women. Women are about 1.7 times more likely to suffer from depression or PMADS during their lifetime than men. Suicide is the fourth leading cause of death in reproductive aged women in the US and worldwide. But in the US, depression is the leading cause of non-obstetric hospitalizations. Perinatal depression accounts for about one in seven women. In the US, in 2016, there were about four million births. So if we estimate that perinatal depression is around 15%, and that's pretty conservative, what we're talking about is nearly 600,000 women. The risk of suicide in these women is 70 times higher. So if you have a psychiatric disorder during your pregnancy, you are at tremendous risk in the first year after childbirth for suicide. It is the third most frequent cause of death among both early and late postpartum women behind natural causes and injuries. So it's really important we know and care about this. <coughs> Some of you are pictorial learners, so I included these in the slides. Um, so you could see what I think is most important right there is about only 15% of postpartum depression ever received professional treatment. Sort of the same thing we looked at yesterday with adolescent girls. Very small percentage are getting treated. What happens in pregnancy if you're depressed and anxious? Well, naturally, you're more likely to have obstetric risks. Higher rates of miscarriage, preterm labor, abruption, preeclampsia. You have inadequate weight gain, underutilization of prenatal care, which is something I see a lot. Women who are depressed and anxious don't like to leave the house, so they find reasons not to go to any appointments, including mine and yours. Uh, there's increased substance use in this population. Their risk of premature birth is higher. There are 
increased risk of recurrent episodes of depression, right? Untreated depression begets more depression, and of course, suicide, like we just said. So what we're talking about, what we're going to go back over throughout this lecture and some of what I talked about yesterday is that this is an intergenerational disease, depression, anxiety. So maternal stress affects the fetus, which changes the biochemical makeup of the child, which then begets an adult that has mental health problems, right? It's, it, the spectrum of diseases that we are preventing if we treat depression and anxiety as early as we see it is profound. So in terms of pregnancy health, up to 70% of women with bipolar disorder experience depression or mania within one month of delivery. So that's why when we talk, I want you to be particularly aware of those people suffering from bipolar disorder. Or if you know them in your practice now, and they're talking about getting pregnant, then it's important you ensure that they have proper psychiatric follow-up. And for these women, it probably does classify as psychiatric follow-up. The incidence of postpartum psychosis is small, one or two in a thousand births, but it is considered a psychiatric emergency. These are the people you have heard about on TV that are written about in newspapers where they have infanticide, feticide, and suicide. We know that prenatal anxiety is a strong predictor of postpartum depression. So for your particularly anxious women in your practice, you want to start getting them support services, referrals, help for managing the symptoms because it oftentimes gets worse. Oops. So what this brings up, the idea that this is an intergenerational illness is this idea of fetal programming. And fetal programming is the capacity of the in utero environment to change or modify the expression of genes in the fetus such that it increases the susceptibility to disease later in life. So local fetal cellular environments are changed by maternal stress, by cortisol and other factors such that tissue expression is altered. That means greater incidence of health problems in the future including heart disease, depression, um, diabetes, hypertension. So it's pretty important. PMADs in pregnancy can affect early developmental outcomes, including neurosynaptic development, regulatory control, temperature control, and developmental milestones. So I know sometimes there's a lot of talk about do you treat women um, with depressive illness in pregnancy? And as far as I know, and I don't have the Bible, or all the, all the research that, of the world that will tell me it's safe, but for my dollar, I'm gonna treat women. And I know I probably see the most serious, the, only the serious people get to me, but if you're in your day-to-day -day office and you see a woman who's complaining of depressive symptoms consistently, you should treat it. The risks in comparison to the risks of using an SSRI for say are, are minimal, so you should Walk away from this knowing it's important that you either get them help if you don't feel comfortable or you start them on treatment. So that's it. This is another pictograph showing um, what happens. If you are a stress mother, you increase your HPA activation. That causes HPG repression. That changes the female reproductive environment which changes the genetic substrate of your fetus, which changes the child and adult that is born. Again, mind blown. Um, so when we look, another pictograph, right, these genetic processes, uh, parental psychiatric disorders and stress do affect our child outcomes. Of course, it's a very complex system. We have um, parenting involved, we have social environment, we have socioeconomic factors, but Starting from my point, from where I am, depression and anxiety need to be treated. So what happens to the infant that is then subjected to the stressed, anxious, depressed mother? So we know they tend to be smaller, IUGR. They come earlier, preterm delivery. They have decreased APGAR scores, a low birth weight, or they are small for gestational age. And very interestingly, and I think more research will come out about this, they have smaller heads. Um, 
They often are, have an early termination of breastfeeding or no breastfeeding, right? Because the maternal dyad, this incredibly important relationship between a mother and an infant is disrupted. And so you have not the same um, social context for the child growing up. The impact of undiagnosed illness is profound. We have a change in neurosynaptic development. We have brain scans showing that uh, parts of infants' brains don't develop the same as those who aren't uh, in families with depression and anxiety. So the areas responsible for social and emotional processing, the premotor cortex, the lateral temporal, prefrontal are changed in babies that are born of mothers with depression and anxiety. Oftentimes we see dysregulated infant and sleep feet, infant sleep cycles and feeding schedules because the responsiveness of a mother who's depressed and anxious to her child is dysregulated. You might, um, or I look at it, sometimes uh, moms who are depressed see a crying baby and they think the baby's sad, right? They're like, oh my goodness, you're so sad, I understand, sadness is, is part of life, that's the way it is, rather than reading the cue as just, no, this is an infant that's hungry. Like it just needs to be held, changed, fed, right? They read the cue wrong, and so then the baby's needs aren't met. And so just what I was saying, the infant caregiver dyad is disturbed. Uh, infants exist and develop within the context of this growing relationship with their primary caregivers. And in a well-functioning dyad, right, the mom or the dad ensures that the infant's cheat, um, needs are consistently, sensitively met, right? And that develops secure attachment. When that's jeopardized, like in depression or anxiety, then the infant's well-being, the infant's attachment, social and emotional growth is disrupted. So here's a pictograph of that, right? If you start out with a mom who is not well, what you end up frequently is a mom and a child who are not well. So when we look as the infant grows into a child, we see that it extends into all realms of a child's development, cognitive, behavioral, language, motor, maternal and paternal depression. I don't wanna exclude fathers here. They get a lot less attention, but it's still important about uh, mother, mother, moms and dads who are depressed, about four months postpartum, they did a study and they looked and saw that the children of these depressed parents had more internalizing and externalizing behaviors. They didn't feel as good about themselves and they acted out more, biting, hitting, screaming, behavioral disturbances by preschool age. So we're already at three, four, five. And we know that children of highly anxious mothers are, have twice the risk for ADHD, and anxiety. So what happens to these children when they grow up into adults? They, as I've said, are at increased risk for psychiatric illness, certainly substance use disorders. They tend to work less, have diminished vocational capacity, and they have an increased risk of medical illness. So that's a lot what we talked about in the fetal programming, the elevated exposure to glucocorticoids looks to alter the hepatic genes that regulate glucose and fat metabolism in that adult. So it's pretty profound. And that's what it looks like. A um, lot of factors contribute to how the fetal environment changes how a child grows into an adult. So who's at risk? Mother, uh, a father, that's a minor, so anyone under the age of 18, and we talked yesterday about how teen pregnancy is increasing, so these are people we have to be particularly watchful for depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. Someone who has a history of trauma or adverse childhood events, which we reviewed yesterday. Someone who has a previous history of depression or anxiety and a past pregnancy or a postpartum illness. A history of sensitivity to hormonal shifts, so these are uh, people who might have a lot of uh, emotional behavioral issues surrounding their period, that they've known that since they were teens or children, and that they grow up and they just have a hormonal sensitivity. So going into a pregnancy, you can expect that they might have 
a lot more problems. People who are unmarried or have poor marital satisfaction are increased risk. People with thyroid dysfunction, because the link between thyroid disorder and depression has long been understood. People have poor social, familiar, financial well-being. And additional exacerbating factors, if you look at this list, it's pretty much every single person on the planet. <laughs> so I, wa I want you to try and take away a couple, um, customize it to your needs, but really, a lot of people in, in today's day and age who are, have busy, stressed lives are at risk for anxiety and depression. So anytime you have a crisis related to the baby or the mother, right, you have preterm labor, you're admitted to the hospital, um, it, it can include a psychiatric crisis but doesn't have to. You have an infant that's really colicky, those are moms that are at risk if the pregnancy is unplanned if there was a loss before this. So some women who have miscarriages often suffer a lot of anxiety around the start of their pregnancy that can carry forth through the postpartum illness. If you're alone, you don't have a lot of social supports, even type A'ers, probably like a lot of people in this room who think they're gonna be like super mom, I'm gonna do this right, nothing happens to me, I got this, I'm on go, everything's perfect and down below the surface, right, that the cracks are showing. Things are, are getting worse. You do have those people, right, that are like, you know, hey, yeah, I'm running three miles a day, and I'm super excited, and, you know, I got my husband off to work, and the four kids are in bed, and it is perfect, and they're growing this belly, and underneath that is like, well, you know, sometimes I'm crying at night, or, you know, yeah, I, I've thought about suicide, right? I mean, it, it is there, it's prevalent. Those people are at risk, too. If you have complications surrounding your pregnancy, preemie infant, trouble with breastfeeding, and it was like your goal to be a breastfeeding mother, that can be a tremendously anxiety-producing phenomena in women, particularly, I don't know, at my hospital, there's a big emphasis on breastfeeding, and while I think breast is best, sometimes I watch my women suffer because they feel like they're bad women because they either can't breastfeed or choose not to, and so that can prompt symptoms. Certainly poor sleep, and it's highlighted because I see this a great deal in women who have go into psychiatric crisis or are admitted for hospitalization. It becomes critical that we talk to them about establishing a normal circadian rhythm, that they really do get the sleep they need, because without it, their symptoms will exacerbate to the point of, of suicidal ideation, oftentimes um, thinking about harming their infants. Um, people who have a lack of foundational attachment as a child, right, who struggled, who were the people who had the ACEs, who had the adverse childhood experiences that have never seen, been part of a secure maternal child dyad, struggle to establish that in their own children because they don't know what it is, or unresolved feelings, as I said. So, <laughs> I hate to beat a dead horse, but I'm gonna. <laughs> Um, adverse childhood events um, are something that uh, big public health concern. What I want you to know is just that, that in terms of an intergenerational illness, women who are from trauma beget children who are victims of trauma. And so the sooner we can intervene and treat, the more likely we help reduce symptoms in future generations. So that's what it looks like. Childhood maltreatment begets a variety of psychological, biological, and behavioral consequences for an adult who then gets pregnant. That changes the gestational biology so you get a fetus, infant, child, adult who also suffers the same consequences. So how do we f find out about depression and anxiety in pregnancy, right? We ask, same thing as I talked about yesterday with teens. If you don't ask, you don't know. So the yield may be low, but the stakes are high. So ACOG recommends screening at least once during the pregnancy. I think we should do it every trimester, maybe every visit. So simple questions to ask every patient. There are validated standardized screening tools. My office uses the Edinburgh, but there are plenty out there. Um, so I say screen antepartum, particularly if you know you have a woman that has suffered from 
depression, anxiety prior to getting pregnant, then in each trimester of pregnancy, postpartum, and I think it should be incorporated into the well child visits, into the infant's first visits, right? Because sometimes you guys aren't gonna see them until six weeks later. It's the pediatrician who sees them one week after delivery. That's sort of gonna get the flavor between postpartum blues or developing psychosis. So they should feel free to ask these questions. And then again, I highlight, you know, the fathers don't get a lot of attention, but it's oftentimes um, the fathers who are suffering as well. So I think we should ask them or ask the moms, hey, how's your father, you know, how's your, how's your father doing? How's your husband doing? Um, is everything all right? Or how's your partner? How's your um, boyfriend? What's going on there? It just increases awareness because it happens to both sexes. It's much more common in women, but that's not to exclude the men. Okay, so let's look at what these disorders entail. I'm not gonna do a whole lot about it. I more just want you to get the gist so you can identify it and refer out as you need, except for um, probably uh, basic postpartum depression, peripartum depression and anxiety, which you might feel comfortable to treat, and I really applaud you if you do. Um, it is certainly coming up in the media. We got a lot of people uh, who have recently been pregnant in the last five years or so who have come forward and said they've had a uh, perinatal illness and so that's helped clarify some of the struggle and reduce the stigma for a lot of women. So postpartum blues versus postpartum depression versus postpartum psychosis. Now I like this slide because um, it, it clearly delineates the three but I don't like it because I don't want you to think that they're on a continuum because they are not. Postpartum blues is sort of normative dysphoria in the first two weeks postpartum, right? So it's a big change. New kiddo in the house, you've got less sleep, everybody's anxious, nobody's sure what's going on, schedules change, and you might be irritable, anxious, you notice your mood's going a few different places, and you're emotionally reactive. That's fine. You just want to ensure that it resolves. And for the great majority of people, it spontaneously resolves and there's no further problems. Now for about 10 to 15% of new parents in the first year postpartum, those symptoms might increase or they might have been as severe from the day of birth. Generally not, but can be, especially if you've had depression and anxiety during the pregnancy that went untreated. The, the birth can trigger the exacerbation of all your symptoms. And it looks like what you learned in medical school with Siggy Caps, right? Excessive guilt, anxiety, depressed mood, insomnia, or hypersomnia. And suicidal ideation goes along with that. So if it's untreated, it can certainly increase in severity. When treated, it too tends to remit. It might take a couple months. I tell my ladies, this is something that won't resolve overnight. Our medications do not work quickly, sad to say, but changing receptors in your brain takes some time. But those women should resolve. Postpartum psychosis, on the other hand, happens to a very small proportion of people, about one to two in a thousand, and it occurs generally in the first three months postpartum, usually in the first couple of weeks, and it's associated with mixed or rapid cycling of mood, agitation, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized behavior, and one thing that I see a fair bit that's not on here is ambivalence. A lot of women who are suffering from depression, yes, but more so reaching into psychotic symptoms, right, the extension outside of reality to being ambivalent about their child. Sort of if you ask them, how are things going at home? Eh, you know, it's fine. Are you worried about stuff? Mm, no, I mean, it's cool, it's good. Right, it's very flat. It doesn't have any sort of affective um, movement around being excited about the baby. Everything's, you know, fine. Yeah, no, are you sleeping? Mm, no. Are you eating? Mm, sort of. Right, it's very flat, and that's something that for me, I've seen a couple of times in my practice, and I think is a pretty good hallmark of a problem, because a woman should be pretty in tune with her child, and upset or anxious, and able to express her emotions surrounding that with a trusted healthcare professional. 
postpartum psychosis, we talk about it because it's a psychiatric emergency. These are women who probably unbeknownst to you are putting together some plans. I'm not talking about they're gonna do it, but they have some ideation about how they're gonna harm themselves, their children, their families. You rarely get it in the office because they can be mood congruent. They know, uh, excuse me, mood incongruent. They know that they shouldn't be thinking these things. They know it's not palatable in our society, so they won't talk about it. It is often only I see in the context of, of my experience that I say to them like, oh, are you thinking about killing your child? Like if you had thoughts about blood spattered on the walls or carrying knives around the house, that I, that, that, that will, oh, you've heard of that before? Oh yeah, I have a knife by the bed. That's not uncommon, but a lot of people have not seen it, so don't know to ask about it. Oh, oh. Okay, so postpartum anxiety and depression. Um, major depressive uh, disorder looks about the same as it does in the DSM for people who are not pregnant. I will say that psychomotor agitation and lethargy are more prominent, which is not surprising. You're trying to care for a new human being. It's anxiety provoking, especially if it's your first time. And being tired, right? That's the hallmark of being a new mom. Um, Postpartum depression is also frequently associated with mood lability. So sometimes people will be like, oh, it's bipolar disorder. No, it's just a depression fluctuating up and down. They can have a preoccupation with their infant's well-being, right? They don't want people around them. Everybody needs to wash their hands. We don't go out of the house for the first three months, right? It becomes excessive. Anxiety with ruminative thoughts, like, oh my gosh, well, what happens if I do this and I, I didn't get this and I didn't sterilize the bottles and I'm not sure if I put the water on and I can't remember who's going to the thing and when is the doctor going and do we have, right? It goes on and on, it's exhausting. And then we see the manifestation of panic attacks because if you're that anxious, it often presents itself in a physical manifestation. So that's what it looks like as a pictorial, right? Anxiety, anger, overwhelmed, sadness. So bipolar disorder, this is where mood fluctuates up and down to a, to a great degree. It's often in the postpartum period, difficult to tell, but certainly if a woman has bipolar, is diagnosed bipolar illness going into pregnancy that you should be on high alert that postpartum she might suffer from an exacerbation, right? Women with bipolar disorder have a one in five risk of a severe recurrence after delivery that might require hospitalization. When we look at um, the connection between bipolar disorder and postpartum psychosis, there's a clear and consistent string of evidence that tells us that they're associated and there's even thought to be a genetic component which we'll see. But so people who are at risk for postpartum psychosis include um, first time moms, people who get pregnant. How often have you heard this? They're bipolar, they have a psychiatrist, they've taken their medications, everything's great. Oops, they pop up pregnant and they don't have an appointment for two months with their psychiatrist and they come to your office and they're like, oh my God, I'm pregnant, I'm so excited. And you say, okay, well, so what meds are you on? Oh, I stopped them all. I'm done, I'm done, I don't need them, I'm good. I don't want the baby to be exposed to anything, I'm good. Right, that should be like, woo warning signs, red flag, red flag, red flag. Like, that's when we need to have an educated discussion about the use of medications in pregnancy, and if you are not comfortable with that, then, then refer it out. I really hope there are providers in your community that can do that. I know there aren't a lot. Um, my information's in the packet. You can always email me. I'm happy to answer questions, and at the end of this slide is gonna be a resource list of, of where you can go to look up online great resources about medications in pregnancy that at least might make you feel more comfortable. Harvard um, Women's Health has a great uh, website so you can look up individual medications and try and better explain what's going on to your patients. So that's sort of the subsets we're looking at um, for PMAD. So great majority of people suffer from postpartum blues. Then that splits until a smaller percentage, somewhere between 10 and 20% suffer from postpartum depression. 
Another 10, 15% suffer from anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders. Several of them are outside of pregnancy, come into pregnancy with an exacerbation of bipolar disorder. And then that little itty, itty bitty circle over here is the postpartum psychosis risk that you don't want to miss. So <clears throat> why do we care? Postpartum psychosis, as I've said, is a psychiatric emergency. These women are at risk for harming themselves, their families, and their children. Onset, as I said, is early, about three to 10 days postpartum, but sometimes you don't notice it, especially because most of these women are trying to hide their symptoms because they know it's not healthy or good or even normative. What it looks like is often rapid mood fluctuation. You're happy one minute, you're devastated the next. Then we come on to sort of the hallmark, right, are these psychotic symptoms, delusions, often around the themes of childbirth, of saving the child. So altruistic suicide. I need to kill my baby because it's better for the baby. God is telling me this. I need to go ahead and make sure that I take care of her in the best way I can, and God is telling me that I have to kill her and all my other children, right? These are, these are the real voices they hear, and it's often mood incongruent, right? They'll appear happy, and they're having these voices telling them to kill their families. They're often disorganized or unusual, and this is where I want to bring up again the idea of ambivalent. They sort of don't care so much about their infant, or they'll be in the office and the infant will be in the car seat and they won't attend to their needs. They don't ask, you know, they don't pull out a bottle or they don't think, you know, that they need to be changed. And if they're crying, they just sort of watch them cry. That can be something for you to walk, uh, watch out for. They often have obsessive thoughts around cleanliness, safety, uh, paranoid thoughts around um, who's going to harm the baby, who's going to harm them, who they need to protect their children from, and sometimes that can perpetuate this idea that if they kill them, they're safer. They can have a delirium-like appearance. I've seen a couple women who aren't oriented, right? They're confused. Regular, everyday women who have professional jobs, who have been caring for their families, start to be unable to organize their days, maybe don't know when it's the weekend are unable to bathe themselves, hygiene decreases. They often experience life as going around outside them while they're just sitting there. And we call that derealization or depersonalization, that you are standing outside your life and everything's going on around you and you're not part of it. Less commonly, we see things like thought broadcasting or thought insertion, that the TV is telling you to do something, or hallucinations with a running commentary. The majority of what I've seen they will be hallucinations, but largely visual. Um, the audio things they hear tend to come from their own minds and they realize that. It's not an external source talking to them like we see in something like schizophrenia. So how does this all happen? <clears throat> well, we don't really know. There's the answer. Um, but we do know that hormones can play an important role, and we've noticed that reproductive hormones uh, influence virtually every major biological system implicated in PMADs, including thyroid function, right? The, the association between thyroid disorder and depression has long been known. Immune function, um, we know that delivery, excuse me, pregnancy is immunosuppressive time and delivery is a pro-inflammatory time. And estrogen regulates cytokine production um, associated with dendritic and macrophagic monocytic function. So hormones are influencing every aspect um, of biology that occurs in PMADs. We know, as we've said, the HPA access is on overdrive, right? There's hypercortisolism associated with depression, and that is in part regulated by estrogen. We know that lactogenic hormones, prolactin and oxytocin, also play a role, and that these hormones can in fact change genetic expression as we seem. So we also know estrogen and progesterone play a role in emotion processing, cognition, motivation, and so they might be influencing the generation and perpetuation of depression and anxiety through those means. So to say that it's complicated is something of an overstatement, and that's a little bit what it looks like, that depression and anxiety are in a feedback loop with sex steroids, the immune system, the neurologic system, 
and our genes to create a devastating illness and disease. So when we look, we know that estrogen is, generally speaking, protective. When they go over and, and do uh, basic science studies about the role of estrogen and progesterone alone, um, they can't make any direct correlations between hormone level and depression level. What they can do or what they do see is a consistent association. Where estrogen exists, generally less depression exists. Where estrogen is gone, generally more mood disorders follow. And we know this occurs by a variety of means. Um, estradiol increases BDNF, and that's helpful in stress and depression. We know that estradiol increases um, cyclic AMP response element binding and neurotropin receptor protein activity, similar to an antidepressant. And we know if we look at imaging studies, that gonadal steroids change the neurocircuitry involved in normal and pathological affective states, right? So sort of the evidence of association is there, but the direct correlation hasn't been made. We also know progesterone has a pretty good anxiolytic effect, and there are now studies out that uh, look at allopregnetolone, which is the neuroactive steroid metabolite of progesterone, that it exerts a dose-related anxiogenic and anxiolytic, excuse me, anxiolytic effect on uh, patients, and it might be responsible for helping women recover from PMS, PMDD, postpartum depression, and also PTSD. And we look at things like oxytocin. It's also implicated in modulating fear and stress responses. And so there's a, a, some new studies about giving people oral oxytocin to see if it can change uh, or manipulate their symptoms with respect to anxiety, depression, and trauma. So again, it's fairly complicated. <laughs> so what should you do? So someone comes into your office and they're depressed and anxious, and let's say it's just that. If you feel comfortable using an SSRI, then that's what you should do. If you do not, then you need to refer to a qualified psychiatrist. If you see someone that seems grossly altered from their regular personality, then that's probably someone that needs a direct referral. And it might be someone that needs a direct referral or a warm handoff that day if you have availability to that in your community. I think beyond an SSRI, you probably, there's probably a few of you, are there, well how about a hands thing? How many of you are comfortable using SSRIs in pregnant women? Woohoo! Oh, I love it. How many of you are comfortable using a mood stabilizer in a pregnant woman? Okay, handful, so I love that. If um, your education is such and your comfort level has advanced to that point, I think that's fantastic, because you might be the one person in your community that can do it. But if you're not, then you have to find someone who is. Um, patients who are bipolar, I generally say if they have a good history of a bipolar one episode, a true mania, where they exhibited psychotic symptoms, possibly the majority had a um, hospitalization, then they probably need psychiatric care during their pregnancy because they are at so much increased risk for a re-exacerbation, a recurrence of their bipolar disorder, and those are the women that we worry might have psychotic illness uh, in the postpartum period. So I would refer those out. But I also think there's a huge role that maybe we're not seeing about relapse prevention planning that should occur prior to pregnancy, right? That we begin talking to our pregnant women about their medications, and if they're on an antidepressant, we inform them, hey, it's probably a great idea that you stay on it, especially if they're, they come to you and they're already pregnant. I think there are, there's large room for discussion if a woman comes to you and she's planning pregnancy, she's been on an antidepressant for a couple of years, she feels really well, she would like to try to come off it in preparation for pregnancy. Fantastic idea, I think that's great. But when you are already in the midst of the pregnancy, when hormonal symptoms are taking over, when the milieu has changed from your normal baseline, I think it's probably better that you stay on your medications. It doesn't fit for everyone, but I think as a general rule, it's pretty good. I think you have to talk to these women about obstetric birth plans. What could happen? What if breastfeeding goes wrong? 
are your medications safe in breastfeeding? And I have some resources at the end that can help with that. But I think the more we educate women going forward, the better off they're gonna be. And then one of the hallmarks of what I do if they make it to me and they're having tremendous symptoms is that we work on strategies to help these women in pregnancy, in the postpartum period, to get sleep. A stable circadian rhythm is incredibly important. It helps limit their stress. It helps increase the infant uh, mother-child bonding. And it helps them enjoy being a mother. So if you have to bring in a night nanny, sometimes hospital systems have people at their disposal who can come in. It's not often. But support systems, bring in parents, friends. And you have to encourage the mother to be able to give her infant over to her husband, her boyfriend, a caring friend, for some period of time so she can get stacked sleep in a regular pattern, because that really will help emotional symptoms. So like I said, I think preconceptual counseling is great, especially you know the healthier moms are going in, dealing with obesity, smoking, nutritional deficiencies, um, intimate partner violence, right? That harkens back to this idea that adverse childhood experiences beget hypercortisolism, beget changes in the fetal environment. So if we start dealing with these problems up front, you get healthier women, healthier babies, healthier adults. So there are some resources for you. Um, I love uh, womenshealth.gov um, and I love womenshealth.org, which is uh, Mass General's women's health site. So those are included for you. And thank you. Questions? Hello. I have a question. Have you ever seen a, um, a postpartum psychosis in a uh, multi-gravid multi woman in a first trimester miscarriage, like after a first trimester miscarriage? Thank you. I have I not. <laughs> I have not seen it. Do I think it's, do you know, does she have a psychiatric history? Um, she did have a little bit of a psych, psychiatric history. Um, but had gone through three pregnancies, no, no problems, had children, and then had a, a miscarriage in the first trimester and, and had a total psychosis. Wow. No, I have not seen that. I, uh, very unusual, but I trust and believe it happened. Yeah, it, was the it was the first time we had seen something like that. I yeah, was I've not seen it. Oh. Huh. Okay. Did she get better? No. Really? How, when did she come to the attention of psychiatric care, do you know, like? She committed suicide, oh. so, you know, and uh, yeah, the, the husband felt that she committed suicide rather than harming her children, uh -huh. the existing children. So, but it, it's not uncommon. You know, it was like within two weeks of her miscarriage. So, it, it, you know, it just shocked everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's so. quite shocking. And I would yeah. wonder if we dug into the history a little more, I would bet the symptoms were there during the entirety of when she got pregnant, that they just kept worsening and maybe she didn't speak about it, we didn't know. Yeah. Tragic. Okay. okay, is there any uh, research or correlation or what are your feelings about, I was a labor and delivery nurse years ago oh. and we had nurseries and the baby could go to the mom, but the baby could come back to the nursery and the mom could sleep. But now with baby friendly, I'm a psych NP, so I see a lot of the postpartum people. It seems that it's both good and bad. I sort of agree with you. We're like in a catch-22 because one style doesn't fit all. No. Right, so some moms are coming into delivery and they maybe have borderline symptoms or they have full symptoms and they're depressed and anxious and then they have a baby and they're like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And it's a very delicate balance between, you know, encouraging the infant caregiver dyad and then also saying, you know what, let's take the baby back to the nursery. You need five, six, seven, eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. And particularly in those first couple of days in the hospital, you can get it. Right, and you may have four kids at home. Right. So this where did like, that initiative come from? I don't, I don't know. Okay. Not me. Just curious. <laughs> Just curious. There's a very large movement, and there's good data showing increased infant morbidity uh -huh. and infant mortality in hospitals with baby-friendly. 
I would encourage everybody to go back to their hospital and demand mommy friendly as well. Right, because one patient said to me, which was very profound, she said, if you and I had surgery, would you expect me to get up and take care of you? <laughs> <laughs> but right but, it is it's and it, it is true we know for a variety of other illnesses like infants that are now born of opiate dependent mm -hmm. mothers or substance use dependent mothers those babies do tremendously better with skin to skin bonding right. um, close eat sleep console um, modules but that can occur with a mother a grandmother a husband mm -hmm. right it doesn't have to be such an emphasis on the mom so yeah I think you have to look at your hospital policy certainly babies do better but we have to care about our mom well too. it seems that there's not a uh, there's not an in-between point because the people I'm seeing I'm located in OBGYN hospital but it's with the bet with the nursing yeah. Sometimes there's too much pressure on the mom when she can't do it, and there's too much pressure to never, we don't really have a nursery, but right. we do have a place, and I think we should be able to say to our mothers, you know, or the doc should, it's okay. You yeah. know, when you start to learn to, do, when you start to want to breastfeed, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You, it doesn't happen, it's okay. There's been a generation of people. And if you're not getting sleep while you're in the hospital, there is a place we can let your baby, like a nursery, and go to the nursery. I think we should make them aware because I'm seeing lots of women with sleep deprivation, deprivation and guilt over breastfeeding. I agree. I think it's so hard to, you know, like a universal policy doesn't fit. And so it's hard to allow when they make policies to allow nurses the freedom to say like, hey, listen, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea if you got a couple hours of sleep because it's often the nurses who are spending the great, great majority of time with these people, not the doctors. So even, I mean, I prepare my women. We have educational seminars coming up to their delivery about what you can ask for, what you can do, but still they get to the hospital, right, and they get scared and they don't want to look abnormal and they don't want to say anything wrong and so they just do whatever they're told and, you know, it's hard. How many people here practice obstetrics? All right, do any of you employ or have in your practice counseling for your patients? I do that like I'm in the hospital. All right. But I'm not a family nurse practitioner as well, but I'm not a patient. You are the two people in the room? Yeah. Wow. For. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. For postpartum depression, what is the duration of treatment with an antidepressant that you would typically recommend to prevent relapse or treat them adequately? And the second question is, how long is it appropriate for a general OBGYN to be treating? Obviously, it's ideal to get them into psych as well right away, but we're a community hospital, so we have very difficult issues with access to psych. So. So what generally speaking, if you have certainly a history of depressive illness or a perinatal mood disorder, then I say you should be treated with an SSRI most typically for a year. Generally speaking, I try to encourage women that after they deliver a baby, it's a time of incredible change, financial, physiologic, emotional, that this isn't the time to try and experiment off their medications. And if you're starting one, then what we're trying to do is stabilize your neurologic environment for an extended period of time so you can get through the major stressors of your life. So I look at that first year, it's very transitional. And so then at the end of the year, I might evaluate and say, okay, how are things at home? Like, is your marriage stable? You know, is there violence? How, you know, how have you been doing from an emotional standpoint, from a financial standpoint? Are you back to work? And if all those things are in line, right, their social supports look just right, then I say, okay, if they want, let's try, try a taper. And then I do that. If not, I say you should continue it. Some people who have had um, recurrent depressive episodes as teens, adolescents, young adults, I say you should stay on it indefinitely. If that's what's helped, let's not rock the boat. I think if you're in a community, you probably are indefinitely treating these women. And right. maybe your best access is books or an email to a physician just so you can touch base, so you can feel a little more comfortable. But you know, this is 
a lot of our country is very rural and there aren't psychiatrists to go around. And even when there are, sometimes they don't feel comfortable in an obstetric environment. Right. So you might be the only right. bastion of hope. So I think you continue on. Okay. And then um, how frequently are you seeing, I, I mean, I'll, t I'll typically see them every one or two weeks initially and then, ultimate, and then stop seeing them at some point, you know, they kind of fall off. So what, what's the recommended interval for follow-up? There really isn't one. I can tell you what I do. Um, generally speaking, when women come to me, I sit in the OB clinic of our hospital. And so anybody that's uh, PHQ-9 or Edinburgh um, depression scale is elevated, gets referred to me, and I see them throughout the course of their pregnancy. And it depends on the severity of symptoms. So more severe, probably every two weeks. Less severe, once a month follow them throughout the course of their pregnancy. Then as they transition into the postpartum period, again, if symptoms increase about every two weeks, sometimes if it's a postpartum psychosis or I'm worried the thread doesn't feel right, the symptoms just don't feel good to me, once a week until I feel good, then I space it out and we're back to once a month. And then eventually those women who have enough psychiatric illness to begin with then get referred to my private psychiatric clinic for care Our outside home. the postpartum period. Okay, thank you. My question would be like from a liability standpoint, what do you do with that patient that you are concerned about and you've made referrals and the patient doesn't follow up and you've sent the phone, I mean you've made the phone calls, can't get a hold of the patient. What do you do at that standpoint? I think you document, document, document. And you do, you know, you have to do what is with, in the medical standard, you can't make people come to treatment, right? You can't make them take their medications. Um, if you are concerned, I have gone so far, if I'm concerned enough and I cannot um, get in touch with them, I do a mental health check, I call the police. Send the police right out to your house. And that can prompt an ECO, which is a psychiatric hold, essentially. They're brought to the hospital. From the hospital, they can progress to a TDO, which is a temporary hold in a psychiatric facility, before they're seen by a judge. But if the symptoms got that severe, that's what I do. When you start a patient on an SSRI postpartum, what do you counsel them about breastfeeding? So I tell them a small amount of their medication is transmitted to the fetus. I often, uh, excuse me, to the infant. I, ba I try to give them the analogy that essentially about one one thousandth of the dose that they take gets to their brain because you have to go through the GI tract, the GI tract across the liver, the liver up into the bloodstream, the bloodstream into the brain. Then comes out of your breast milk into the baby. It's got to go through the baby's GI system, across the baby's GI system, through the liver, into the liver, through the bloodstream, <laughs> through the bloodstream, into their head. So it's a very small uh, proportion of, of medication that's getting to them. And all our research tells us that it does not affect, in the long term, behavior and emotional outcomes. Now, do we know for certain? I don't think so. But from what we know, it is safe. And when we look at the data of not treating these women. Mm -hmm. The consequences for that child, as we've seen, are severe mm -hmm. and horrible. Mm -hmm. So in that, framing it that way, you must treat. What are your thoughts or practice in terms of using short-term medications for anxiety while you're bridging that gap in terms of people that have postpartum depression and anxiety, especially in women using opioids <laughs> who just had a C-section? Fantastic question. Um, when I was here before, I had a little spiel about benzodiazepines because they're sort of the bane probably of, the, they certainly are of my existence. I think probably for some of you, especially you, you guys who use psychiatric medications. So benzos can be incredibly helpful as you bridge the time until an SSRI comes to full efficacy. Here's the thing though, you have to be the physician that can set the boundary where a patient cannot, right? Because they, not always, but frequently, will come back to you and be like, you know what, I just, I've just been so anxious. Like you send them out with a prescription for 15, they come back eight days later, 15 days later, 20 days later, I know you told me to wait, Dr. Wells, but like I just couldn't. There's been a whole lot of stress in my house. My, my husband lost his job and the dog ate the cat. And <laughs> I just, I, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't do it. So I, I mean, I just, I maybe took a little more than I'm supposed to. You have to be the holder, the keeper of the goodies. 
So you have to say, listen, I'm sorry. It looks to me like maybe this isn't a good choice for you. Like, because I really need you to take about one a week. And you're taking two a day. So we need to come to a come to Jesus point so we can help you out. And for some people, maybe you, you've, you have a long history with them. You know them. You're like, okay, you give them another prescription and you wait it out. So it's frequent monitoring. It's close prescription use. And it's cutting them off when they don't want to be. But I think it can be very helpful, particularly in very sick psychiatric cases. I tend to use it a lot. It helps sleep in the short term. It helps anxiety in the short term. Those are very good things for. Now, in the case of someone who's a substance use disorder, much harder. Generally speaking, if I have patients who are actively using substances or recently clean, I do not use benzos at all. If you are on buprenorphine and you have a long history, I run a buprenorphine clinic, so I've often seen my women for two and three years. I watch them through the whole pregnancy. If they have a crisis, I might give them 10. And I say, let's see how long you can let that, that, that 10 work for you. And if they do a good job, then they might get 10 more. And this might be over the course of a year that I would give them 10. Otherwise, I say it's too much risk. Certainly, if they're newly sober, the risk of relapse is incredibly high. But what about narcotics like post-op narcotics? So <clears throat> I give them the risks and benefits of it, right? If you have a responsible parent who's depressed, I think handing them 30 perk 10s and 10 clonopin 0.5 milligram probably isn't going to change anything. You have to say, don't breastfeed or um, pump and dump. Don't take them together, no driving, and have a responsible person in charge of the baby. A lot of times around sleep, I make sure, is someone going to be with you at night so you know if you can't hear the baby respond? And if someone can't be there, then maybe it's not a good choice for you at night. Do you think you can limit your use so you can be responsive to the baby? And if they can't, then I don't give it to them. Just to clarify, pump and dump with all benzos and clonopin or just? All benzos. Okay. I do with all benzos. Um, There's one here. Oh, oh, oh go. Oh. <laughs> um, women with postpartum depression who are also taking Suboxone, Methadone, do you have a drug of choice? Short answer is probably no. Um, I think pretty much anywhere in the SSRIs, you're going to be fine. Celexa, Lexapro, Zoloft are probably my th top three for straight postpartum depression in the setting of buprenorphine use. Can you repeat that? In the, she asked, the question was, <clears throat> if you have an opiate dependent woman on Suboxone, Subutex treated with buprenorphine, which SSRIs do I gravitate towards? And I said, top three, Celexa, Lexapro, Zoloft. I also like, let me just throw it out there, Remeron. Um, it ha doesn't have great antidepressant qualities, but it has a great sleep effect, and it has a small appetite inducement effect. So for women that are stressed, stop eating characteristics of depression, it can be a fantastic addition on top of the Celexa Lexapro Zoloft give 7.515 milligrams of Remeron because at the lower doses it helps uh, eating and sleeping. Um, what about Vistaril or Atarax as a so alternative? In, when, <laughs> when women come to me, it's probably the severity of the women that I see. It, it hardly ever is useful enough. Mm -hmm. So I think if you probably have maybe basic postpartum depression, a little bit of anxiety, maybe for me, one in 20, one in 30 women would respond to visceral. Mm -hmm. But if it works or someone comes to you and says like, hey, I tried this before, I'm like, go for it. You know, I think that's a fantastic choice. Some more, I use Buspar quite a bit. But I still say in my practice, like I'll t I counsel my women, like I'll give this to seven out of 10 women and they'll be like, eh, didn't do anything. And then I'll give it to three out of 10, they'll be like, change my life. Like, Dr. Wells, you are Jesus. And so then I think, well, I don't know who the three out of 10 are going to be. So I just kind of throw it and I say, listen, give it a try. See how you do. You might be one of the seven or you might be one of the three. Yeah. 
We have plenty of time for questions, so don't hesitate to raise your hand. Thank you. you had talked about when women come to the office and say, oh yeah, I went off my medications because I found out I'm pregnant. Do you encourage those women to go back on their meds during their pregnancy? So then it sort of requires a careful teasing out of their psychiatric history. What were the medications they were on? It's a great time for reevaluation, particularly if they've taken themselves off everything. Generally speaking, the people I see, because I'm a primarily psychiatric practice, those people need to be on some form of medication. But it's a great time. Sometimes, you know, women uh, go to multiple providers or after a psychiatric hospitalization end up on four or five different meds, right? And then they get pregnant and they stop them all. And it's a good time to reevaluate and be like, okay, well, what do we think were the most critical? What helped the most? And then where's the safety profile in pregnancy? And let's sort of get those on board. Thank you. Your questions? Um, I see a lot of women that tell me early in their pregnancy that they use marijuana to control their anxiety symptoms mm -hmm. and help them sleep and they're not willing to give it up mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so just wondering I. how you respond to that it's tough um, I <clears throat> try to point to the research uh, that tells us that uh, marijuana use over the long term is anxiogenic. It increases anxiety and that we have better medications for the treatment. The problem is with anxiety, right, we don't have great medications. We have great treatments, but those treatments are behaviorally, behaviorally based and they're hard. Meditation, mindfulness, is a practice that you do every day and over time it strengthens your ability to deal with anxiety. But most of my patients who come to my office don't want to hear about my 20 year meditation practice and sitting quietly in a corner and let's breathe together. They're like, my friend um, took this medicine, um, clonis, 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 it's clon it, I think it's a K or a C, I don't know, for anxiety. Do you know about that? And I'll be like, mm, mm, huh. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm not familiar. Maybe you could go, go back to your friend and, and write it out for me and, and bring it to the next, right? You're in a difficult, <laughs> you're in a difficult position because those benzodiazepines work great quickly, but then over time they increase anxiety. They increase your desire for more of them. It's, it's a really bad cycle. So you are faced with trying to help people change their behaviors for chronic anxiety, and, and that's hard. So going back to the original question about THC use, I say, look, we know THC has tons of toxins in it. It's not safe. It's not good for your fetus. It's associated with many, many of the same factors that tobacco use is associated with, and the best thing you can do is decrease or stop using. And here are medications. I can help your nausea. I can help you eat. I can help your anxiety. And so if in the face of me saying all that to you, you walk out of this office and choose to continue to use an illegal drug, because it still is illegal in most states, then that should tell you something about your use, that it's probably not the most healthy thing for you. And I say, like, it's different. If you're a 55-year-old individual who's living their life and has a job and contributing to society and pays taxes, whatever, you're going about your life and you want to smoke a doobie at night to calm down, whatever, do it up. You know, that's, <laughs> no, that's none of my business. But if you're coming into my office and you're pregnant and you want to have the healthiest, best pregnancy and be the healthiest, best parent you can be, then the answer is you should stop. Questions? Yeah. Along that same line you were saying about the medications, <clears throat> if they, <clears throat> excuse me, if they were doing marijuana or heroin, <clears throat> somebody else is going to say it, heroin, cocaine, or heavy op opioid pain meds, and they don't know, they didn't know they were pregnant, 
Then they come, oh my goodness, I'm pregnant. What have I done to the baby? Do I need to keep doing it? What would you? Okay, so then that falls into a whole sort of different when we have um, pregnant moms that come in who have substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole other talk on that I can bring tomorrow. No, <laughs> um, but basically speaking, you know, if a woman comes to you and um, she's pregnant and she's using substances, it's sort of pathognomonic that she has a substance use disorder. She's mm -hmm. incapable of stopping because any mm -hmm. pregnant woman in this society is going to try to at least cut down their use, if not not stop entirely uh, if they could. So if they can't and they're still using, it's because it's a significant problem. So depending on the drug is where you're gonna tailor your efforts. If it's an opiate-based problem, then those people I refer, I have my own MAT clinic, medication-assisted treatment clinic, I refer them for buprenorphine therapy. Mm -hmm. In your communities, you might have a methadone clinic. Methadone remains the gold standard, but research is changing around that, and I think buprenorphine will come up because it's affiliated with less uh, symptoms and severity of NAS, but that being said, you get them, you funnel them towards that direction, methadone, buprenorphine. If you have a cocaine, and increasingly I see meth amphetamine habit, ice habit, then your options are smaller. Um, in my community, 30-day residential is something I look at, if not long-term. If this is a mom who is on her fourth child, three are in the care of somebody else, she's still using drugs, I don't think a detox stay in the hospital or a 30-day stay at a regional center is going to work. You need to look at more long-term um, options. So rescue missions in a lot of our larger cities have long-term programs, 12 and 18 months. And then there are several church-based programs all around the United States, probably in your community too, that run one and two year programs that look at substance abuse, but also vo vocational uh, training to get people back up and functioning again. It's an incredibly difficult problem. And oftentimes I see all substance use disorders in one patient, right? So trying to deal with depression, anxiety, opiate use disorder, methamphetamine abuse, episodic, you know, THC use, chronic, it's, it's very difficult. Hey, here we go. I'm having some pregnant women coming in uh, wanting to use CBD oil to help them with anxiety. What are your thoughts on that? I think we don't have good literature about it. It depends on where you're accessing it. The strains of CBD oil are very different in the quantities of the actual cannabinoids they have. So I still, it's a, con you know, to me it comes back to, it's a convenient excuse, sort of. I can tell you how to get rid of your anxiety and depression. Why are you trying to seek out a substance? Like, excuse me, I misspoke. I can teach you how to help your anxiety. And sometimes it helps depression, but our, our data about the behavioral um, modifications that can be made to help anxiety are far greater than that for depression. But I can give you techniques to use to help your anxiety, choosing an often illegal, poorly studied drug to expose yourself and your baby to seems sort of asinine to me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time. I speak pretty straight to my patients. I, I curse a lot. I'm like a Navy sailor in the office. <laughs> and I just like try to get it across to them. If you're trying to seek out an illegal means to help your symptoms in the face of a caring provider who can give you suggestions, referrals, and medications, you have to look at your reason behind wanting it. And it often has to do with the fact that it's rooted in an unhealthy predilection for substance use. Well. Mic drop. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Thanks, everybody. Thank I appreciate Thank it. You.